visit is by getting nominations. So uh, nominations are welcome at any time. We're set for this year. We, intend, we did this last year, we did it the year before, and we did it the year before. So we intend to do it next year. Uh, my colleague Sean Harper and I uh, are coordinating the program, and we get excellent help from uh, uh, Melissa Kampati and Bodhi and Diana Johnson. So uh, today, uh, oh, my name's Andy Porter. Uh, and uh, today, uh, I get to introduce our speaker, uh, Carolyn Dyson. And she comes to us from the University of Michigan, where she is a sociologist. Uh, she was trained as a sociologist at uh, UC Berkeley. Thank you for the introduction and thank you all for inviting me to visit. It's been a pleasure um, being here and getting to know about the work some of you are doing. I'm going to spend the next hour or so, I'm looking for a clock and don't see one so I'm going to use my phone. A bell rule. Oh, okay. <laughs> That'll be helpful. Um, so I'm going to talk for about the next hour about the work I've been doing for the last 12 years or so, uh, much of which has culminated in this book, uh, Integration Interrupted. Um, the book draws on findings from four uh, qualitative studies focused on schools and students. Uh, I came to the study of education through my interest in stratification and inequality, and I was especially intrigued by um, the black-white achievement gap and the relative underachievement of black students. So my research is designed to learn more about the schooling process. Um, I wanted to know more about the schooling experiences because I saw schools as so central to um, the 
uh, American dream. Uh, and so I, I thought that the place to study, instead of looking at families, uh, would be really the institution. And I wanted to look at students within schools to understand what happens inside schools that could either help facilitate the process of social mobility or um, at times impede that um, process. So that's where I was focused. Um, and as most, most of you are well aware that this country has been dealing with um, racial gaps in achievement for decades. And researchers have been particularly interested, as I am, in uh, the black-white achievement gap ever since uh, the publication in 1966 of James Coleman's Equality of Educational Opportunity. And so over the years, a variety of theories have been uh, proposed to explain the underachievement of black students. And perhaps the most popular is the notion that African Americans have developed a culture, a negative cultural orientation towards academic achievement and schooling in general, and have come to, do, come to view doing well in school as acting white. In other words, this argument proposes that blacks um, have sort of a, uh, a cultural logic that constructs educational achievement as uh, uncool, as antithetical to school learning. And so in their attempts to avoid being seen as acting white, black students are um, uh, downplay or camouflage their achievement, and this then leads to depressed outcomes. And so that's the argument that's made here. And so we see this, a lot of this kind of argument, and you uh, see this uh, cartoon on the boondocks, and this is an illustration of that sort of argument where the little boy is saying he has a problem with his grade, and the teacher says, well, if you want a higher grade, you need to work harder. And he says, higher? I don't want a higher grade. I'm a thug. I'm from the streets. I want a D. Shoot, fail me. And then she says, don't you live on Timber Deer Lane, which I guess is supposed to indicate uh, a suburban area. And he says, yeah, OK, but I live on the hardcore side of Timber Deer. I swear I've seen Crips on my block just last week, right? So this is the kind of depiction of black students not wanting to be seen as achievement oriented. And even if they are n sort of not suburb, not urban kids who again, are constructed in this way that these are hardcore kids and achievement is not something that they're interested in. And so I wrote Integration Interrupted because so much of what I was finding in my work over the years seemed inconsistent with these types of arguments. And uh, you, you know, as I said, you see this everywhere. It's in the media, it's in school, it's in my classes. Any discussion of um, differences, racial differences in achievement leads to a uh, conversation about um, differences in motivation and in how much people value education or whether at all education is valued in the home. Pick up any book or article about um, black student achievement and you're sure to find some discussion of acting white and in fact it drives me crazy. Um, and, and, you know, there is sort of an intuitive plausibility to the argument, but the question is, is it accurate? And for those of you who are not familiar with the term acting white, it's generally used among black youth and, and sometimes adults to convey that a black person's behavior, style, or taste signal white rather than black cultural patterns and traditions. And while scholars tend to criticize this as essentialist, um, and argue that there's nothing authentic or natural about being black, this kind of racialized name calling really does have a long history among black Americans. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with the um, term Oreo, for example, uh, black on the inside, white on, uh, black on the outside, white on the inside, and a number of other studies examining black life in America under slavery and Jim Crow show that these practices indeed of attempting to um, establish the boundaries of black blackness are uh, longstanding. But there is evidence, um, there is no evidence that I'm aware of that shows that prior to 1980, prior to the 1980s, what it meant to act white actually included 
uh, achievement and achievement-related behaviors. One of the earliest publications to reference acting white in education-related research uh, is a 1970 article about black students in high school, in a high school that was uh, newly desegregated. And the black students raised concerns about blacks beginning to act white, but at the time they characterized that only as being more inhibited, more formal, and lacking soul. So more recent studies, however, have um, uh, reported that among adolescents, acting white currently includes being in honors classes, advanced placement classes, getting good grades, going to class, and doing schoolwork, among other things. So this is an expansion in the meaning of this term. And so I asked the question, what led to this racialization, to the expression of school achievement related behaviors as acting white? In other words, how and why has achievement become a cultural object, a symbol like apple pie and baseball, representing what it means to be American or in this case, white? Uh, so scholars like John McWhorter and Edmund Gordon have conceptualized this new use of the term acting white as simply another manifestation of the oppositional nature of black youth culture. They seem to accept the argument put forth by John Agbu and Signithia Fordham that black Americans have developed a collective or social identity in opposition to whites and a cultural frame of reference to maintain boundaries between blacks and whites. But few scholars have actually stopped to ask just how or why academic achievement became part of this boundary making and a symbol of whiteness among black youth. Recently, economists uh, Roland Fryer and Paul Torelli used this argument about resistance to acting white to explain racial differences in popularity among a national sample of high school students. Uh, they found that popularity peaked at 3.5 for black students, while white students continued to gain popularity as their uh, GPA increased. And so Fryer and Torelli uh, saw this as evidence of uh, the acting white hypothesis because they defined it as any statistically significant racial difference in the relationship between popularity and grades. Um, but the evidence from numerous studies, in fact, shows that this definition is flawed and shows how important it is for us to have an accurate definition of a phenomenon in order to be able to construct valid measures. And so these are just a, a sample of um, studies that have found support for or no support for um, either the oppositional culture or burden of acting white arguments. And this is where I enter the debate, because my findings suggest that what Fryer and Torelli are observing is not evidence of resistance to acting white and rejection of high achieving black students, but in fact is evidence of an institutional isolation effect. Okay, and so this difference is not trivial. If we understand the black-white achievement gap to be a result of students framing achievement as acting white and ostracizing high achieving students, then our solutions for closing the gap would center on changing students' attitudes and behaviors. But if we don't have a good grasp of why students might frame achievement as acting white in the first place, when, how, why it happens, then our solutions are not likely to be effective because they won't target the actual source of the problem. And so my findings indicate that the source is not black students' attitudes at all. And so what I'm going to do this afternoon is show you some of those findings. I want to say at the outset that I um, never set out to study this um, uh, concept of, of acting white at all. It wasn't the focus of my research. But um, over the years, as I uh, continue to do my research in schools and on students, more and more my findings were speaking to this and I felt like it was necessary to make an intervention um, here. Um, because my findings were revealing something that I thought um, no one was talking about at the time and that was the connection between this notion of acting white and linking it to academic achievement and the practice of curriculum tracking. 
uh, and, and how uh, the school racial composition matters for that as well. And so while sociologists have long been interested in uh, how tracking contributes to social inequality, most studies have focused on predicting uh, the factors that predict where students end up in track placement and also in uh, examining what the effects of placement are on student achievement. But where I focus is uh, really m looking more at the process of tracking. I'm interested in sort of the institutional factors that um, create particular policies and practices around tracking, and most importantly, the social consequences of those practices and policies for uh, students. Uh, so there are many studies, then this is just a list of some studies that have documented racial disparities in student placement in U.S. schools. And this research dates back nearly 30 years. What these studies find is that black students are disproportionately um, represented in the lower level remedial and special ed classes and significantly underrepresented in advanced classes such as AP, honors, and uh, gifted classes. And those tend to be disproportionately white. And some researchers refer to this pattern as uh, second generation segregation, within school segregation, or racial tracking, or racialized tracking. Now, there's no doubt that racialized tracking has important consequences for students' opportunities to learn and for their achievement outcomes. But there are also important social consequences, and I, I try to address those in my book. So, uh, in the book, I, as I said, I bring together um, the results of four different studies um, because they provide a variety of data. For example, as you see there, um, ethnog <laughs> eth uh, ethnographic studies, most of them, they involve um, about 275 student interviews, parent interviews, teacher and um, administrator interviews. They provide um, a diversity in terms of the racial composition of schools. They provide elementary, middle, and high schools, and also diversity in um, SES level, and uh, diversity in terms of the students that are involved in the study. So some of the studies are focused on black students, and others have a racially diverse uh, group of students. Um, and so it, although I don't have any data that follows students from elementary through high school, I do have students at every level. So it gives me a good understanding of the processes at each stage of uh, students' uh, schooling experience. Um, all of these studies were conducted in the South, three of them in North Carolina. Uh, so in my talk today, I'm gonna draw mostly on the evidence from the fourth study. And I collected that study, I collected the data for that study with uh, Sandy Darity and Dominique uh, Castellino. And so from 19, uh, from 2001 to 2004, Sandy and Dominique and I uh, undertook this study of high achieving black students at 19 different uh, North Carolina schools. And the goal was to simply study the achievement gap from the perspective of success. So we thought perhaps high achieving students might teach us something about achievement, either about um, you know, how they've been successful and maybe also tell us something about failure in, in the process. And so what we did is with the help of the high school guidance counselors, we identified students at each school who had been on the uh, honor roll for two or more consecutive semesters. And, uh, from the different high schools, we wanted at least five students, but we, as you see, we weren't always successful in getting um, five students. Sometimes they didn't have five students to uh, recommend to us to uh, even recruit for the study. So we took what we can get. In some places, we got more than five, but it, mostly we were not able to get five students in each. But it turns out it, this was perfect because following 65 students for two years, was really difficult with two, uh, two research assistants. And basically what we did was we went to school with these students. So we would call the night before and um, have them meet us either for first period or it may have been after lunch or second period. So we 
had an opportunity to go to class with all of the students, to go to their extracurricular activities with them. We hung out with them at lunchtime. We also um, collected uh, survey data from them. We interviewed their parents and uh, we interviewed them both at the beginning of the study and at the end of the study. So we collected a lot of detailed information about these students' schooling experiences. There were uh, 64 juniors and one student who was misidentified as a junior, but she was actually a sophomore. So we kept her in and we uh, followed them <laughs> through graduation. Um, having the 19 different high schools gave us uh, an opportunity to look at how the racial composition of the school might matter for students' uh, schooling experiences. And so as you can see, we had schools that were less than 10% black and then uh, all the way up to a school that was almost 90% black. Um, and so as I said, we didn't set out to study um, students' experiences with acting white, um, but a similar pattern emerged here uh, to our previous studies and what was interesting about this piece is that it was solely focused on uh, high achieving black students and so if there is any um, ostracism of students for acting white it is usually directed towards the higher achieving students so this actually gave us an opportunity to be able to look at um, that experience of being accused of acting white. And so now what I want to do is just um, give you a glimpse of what I saw, what we saw in following these uh, students at school. So some of you may be familiar with this um, uh, pattern. How many of you are familiar with tracking at all? Oh, so all of you from the school event. What did I think? Okay. Um, and so this, you know, won't be shocking to you to see um, these kinds of patterns. So as we follow the students around and going to their classes, one of the things that I want to point out is, so in this first column here, it's just the racial composition of the school and it's just pulling out black versus non-black. Um, uh, so this school, Anderson High School, this is one student's classrooms that we observed. So going to class with her over time, and the school is 33% black, but as you can see, for all of the AP and honors classes, there's significant underrepresentation of black students in those classes. But when you look at the one class that she had that was a standard class, you see that um, it's actually an overrepresentation of black students. And I'm going to bore you to tears with these slides, but the, the point is to have you feel the same way in terms of how repetitive this pattern was, how much we saw it. So here's another high school, Rolling Hills High School, and we're following Tanya, and this school is 18% black, and you see the same thing, the underrepresentation in the honors courses, and then the overrepresentation in the regular uh, courses. And here is Amanda's classes at Garden Grove. And the same thing, the um, overrepresentation of black students in the lower level classes and the significant underrepresentation in, um, in the higher level classes. And I, I want to say that this tracking was also something that I hadn't studied in the past and wasn't very familiar with myself. Um, I'd never experienced this. I went to predominantly black schools, so this was not in my experience and it was not on my horizon as something that was um, necessarily significant. Um, it became significant in doing this and it was often the students who sort of pointed things out. So um, as we would call students at night and say we're coming to shadow you tomorrow, uh, once I remember a student said to me, okay, but we're going to be the only two black people in the class. And I found that interesting that she felt like she needed to warn me that there wouldn't be other black students in the class. So that gave me some sense that perhaps she was uncomfortable with that experience in that she needed to tell an adult um, to, be, you know, to be warned about this. Uh, and so another experience, uh, Keisha's classrooms at, at uh, Garden Grove, uh, same pattern. The courses that are um, standard courses, you see here, it's uh, 
overrepresentation, overrepresentation, and then the significant underrepresentation in the upper level classes. I could go on with slides like these, right? So rolling hills, same thing, same thing over and over again. And this is uh, for all of the classes that we observed at um, Everton High School, 21% uh, black, same thing. You see lower level class, food and nutrition, 83% black. Um, marketing, 37% black. And all of the other uh, advanced classes you see underrepresentation. And here, this was an interesting uh, case too because this school looked very much racially diverse, racially balanced, and yet we had the same pattern. You have the school is almost 44% is black, and yet 5% black in AP classes. Um, this one uh, honors English class always stuck out to me. Uh, and when I wrote about it in my field notes, I, I, uh, I um, wrote a sense of shock that there were so many black students in an honors level class. It turns out it was a mixed classroom. So it was a classroom that was both honors and um, standards. The black that students explained why there were so many white uh, black uh, students schools. in that classroom. And so, what does this mean for students' experiences? Look at um, the predominantly one black of the things, students, and this is uh, that high school that I want to say about this is that percent black. What we, we observed uh, over 300 classrooms, right? But right. at the same so time, the that's just a small percentage of all of the classrooms um, at and those schools. But this is data from the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction for all of the schools included in our study. And this shows the level of disparity in these honors and AP classes. So what this highlighted column does is zero represents no minority students in the class. And, uh, the uh, one represents parity, so that the uh, representation of my of actually this is just for minorities. It's not just black students. One represents um, parity, so that black students are equally or minority students are equally represented in these classes uh, in relation to their overall population in the school. And so what I've done is bolded those places where it is less than 0.25. Um, and so that shows a significant level of underrepresentation of black students across the board in these upper level classes at these schools. And so this is not just um, one uh, AP or honors English class. This is all the classes, and this tells us something about the degree to which uh, minority students are underrepresented in AP and honors courses. And one of the things to point out is that um, uh, the math and science classes tend to be the worst in terms of the uh, underrepresentation of minority students. They, they fare much better in English and, and history um, honors classes. And I also want to point out that uh, this school here, City High, uh, one of the reasons that their numbers look as good as they do, even though they don't look that great, but they look as good as they do is that school is um, part of the network that is really focusing on minority achievement and so they have some programs in the school to increase the representation of minority students in upper level classes and one of those programs is AVID. Um, and so that may explain some of why they're uh, not doing as bad as uh, some of the other schools. And you see Banneker High School here is the only school that you know, at least gets close to reaching parity in terms of the representation of uh, minority students in upper level classes. And although they still are underrepresented in those classes relative to their um, overall numbers in the school, uh, they at least make up a majority of the students in those classes, right? And so, you know, if you know anything about schools, you know that these patterns are pretty common in uh, American public schools, right? And so what I found though is that this pattern of racialized tracking, as I mentioned, leads to this situation of isolation for high achieving black students. So if we go back to thinking about uh, Roland Fryer's study, for example, this is the point about the difference between 
black students uh, not having friends because they're being rejected by other blacks as opposed to understanding that what's happening inside of schools is those high achieving students are isolated from the majority of students. And so what I want to do is hear a little bit about um, their experiences. Um, so the, uh, I put this up to remind us that the idea of acting white has been around for a long time. And so these are just some of the sort of stereotypical uh, preferences that black kids talk about. Whites do this, blacks do that, right? That um, this is how blacks dress and whites wear shorts in the winter. And so they have this whole um, long uh, list of things that blacks and whites do. And yet, so now it's why is achievement added to this list? And so when we're talking to the students in these schools about their experiences and asking them, um, you know, what do their peers say about them being in the advanced classes, we get this linking of race with achievement, but only in particular contexts. So the thing to pay attention to is the percent black here. So we have Juliana at a school that is 21% black, and she says that you know the students make fun of her, saying that she turned white on them, and they said that she'd be up in the white people class, right? So again, how this is now being constructed as white. Um, this is another um, student talking about this, and here we get this this real sense of this isolation effect. And this student, Sandra, is a student at Everton High School, right? So this is a school that's 44% black. And yet, as she explains, she ran into problems because of my classes that I couldn't take with a lot of black students, so I was mainly, I had to make friends with a lot of white students because those are the only people who are in my classes. And those are the people that I tend to sit with at lunch because I never met anyone else. I mean, I had black friends, but because I didn't see a lot of them, I made friends with white friends. And because of that, the black girls thought that that meant that I, I didn't want to be with other black people and thought that I was better than them and I was trying to act white. And so we asked, and what were the classes that you were taking uh, where there weren't so many black students? I was in gifted uh, AG English and advanced math. I didn't see, I was basically the only black person in my class. I didn't see them. How is this possible in a school that's 44% black? And what I find most striking about this is the normalcy the way that all of the teachers and administrators don't bat an eye to these patterns um, that they see every day. And so we all think of this as normal. And I'm going to come back to, um, to um, thinking about sort of how students get, get placed. But for right now, I just want to focus on pointing out how this racialized tracking creates an institutional isolation effect for black students. Um, so here's another student. Uh, who uh, said that students used to call her a nerd and that some of them teased her about what math she was in and how she was always in the white classes. Again, constructing these upper level classes as white spaces. And one of the things that she said was that she never saw another black person in her um, upper level classes until uh, the 11th grade. Um, another student at City High uh, was explaining to us how some of the students, the black students, um, ostracized him when he was in the uh, earlier grades. And he says, because the majority of, the, of my classes was with white people, so I was friends with them, and they were like kind of, I'm sorry, I, I try to represent exactly how yeah. the kids speak, so there'll be a lot of likes and ums and so forth, and that's how they speak, and I try to be true to what they say. Um, and they were smart, and I was smart with them or whatever. Like ninth grade year, ninth grade, the whole ninth grade year, I didn't chill, I didn't do nothing. Basically, my dad had me on lockdown and stuff like that. But I really didn't do anything. So it was like black students were saying about me, he don't, he don't, he ain't all that. So black students, again, were thinking that he thought that he was better than them, and they called him conceited and pretty white boy um, was the name that they had for him. And then he explained that he turned things around later by hanging out with the students more. So what we find for these students is they actually have to make an effort to go out and to meet other black students and interact with them um, 
another uh, isolation effect a student Sabrina at uh, uh, a school that's 33 percent black and she says I think the fact that like cuz usually like I said most of my friends come from classes I've been in and we just end up in a tight bond and since like you're like a black person in honors class there's not many black people around you so like you bond with the white students with you and stuff like that but I'm just mainly I go with people who I have things in common with and I like I guess education would be a big staple in that also so I just happen to like bond with people and like just cause most of them are white or there some are black it's just they kind of see me like oh you just want to be white or whatever so what we find is over and over in these schools that are racially diverse or predominantly white the black students this underrepresentation in advanced classes leads to this isolation effect that students are experiencing other students accusing them of acting white and I want to say that this is not the experience of most of the students in fact only 13 of the 65 students just about a fifth of them actually had this experience of being accused of acting white. So it wasn't the experience of everyone. It doesn't mean that for every school that, where there's racialized tracking, you're going to have this experience. And I want to make that very clear because uh, the, the whole argument about acting white makes it seem like it's such a prevalent experience and of course it explains the achievement gap. Well, if it's not happening to most students, it means that most students actually don't have to contend with that and there's no need for many of them to even respond to it in any way, whether it's um, to uh, downplay their achievement or to opt for different, different classes. Um, but nonetheless, there are some students who are experiencing it, and for those students, it can be pretty devastating. And in fact, Sandra, the student who was at the school that was 44% black, explained um, how devastating it was and how depressed she was for a long time because of the experience. And what she did was she tried to fit in more with black students. She tried to listen to, B she listened to BET more, she listened to urban radio, and she was trying to learn what does it mean to be black and to adopt black um, styles. And so she tried to do that and then hang out more with the black students in the cafeteria and it backfired because they thought that she was mocking them. And so she said that she tried to um, uh, just go in a completely different direction and so she started doing Wicca and she just started wearing black lipstick and everything black and that ostracized her even more. So then she decided maybe she should leave the school. And uh, she checked out a small private school but found that there were many cliques there and she thought she wouldn't fit in so she came back. Now, so for the students who do have this experience then, it can be pretty traumatic. Um, but again, we shouldn't then take that to mean that all students are having this experience. And even for Sandra, um, and students who have had these experiences that have been um, isolating for them and traumatizing, none of them stop taking advanced courses or uh, stop doing their homework. But I want to say that the students we studied were the students who were successful. So it may be that there were some students who did do that early on, and of course they weren't in our, in our study. But what we do find though, um, and I don't talk much about here, is that for these students, many of them had that dip uh, and usually came in ninth or 10th grade where they were so preoccupied with fitting in that they did try to downplay and camouflage their achievement. But by the 11th and 12th grade that we were seeing these students, all of them had come back. And so what we find is that for at least for high achieving students, they all have a history um, of achievement whereby even if there's a dip, they, they b believe that they're smart. They see themselves as smart and they can rebound from that. For lower achieving students who may have these same struggles of trying to fit in, there's not much to come back from in terms of knowing that you're smart and you, um, and you can get back on track and start taking advanced classes. And so for example, if you, um, look at uh, the GPA of the students, you see that the mean GPA was 2.6 to 4.6. And so what that 2.6 represents is some of that dip for students early on in their academic careers, either ninth grade or 10th grade. But remember, our criteria for uh, participation in terms of being a high achieving student uh, was two or more consecutive semesters on the 
honor roll. So all of these students had come back from what perhaps could have been um, uh, going off track early on. And so again, at Roland Hills High School, a student talking about um, having this sense that it's always been that the smart people are the white people, right? And because she was black, she wanted to fit in the, with the white with the black people, but she began talking about how in her middle school there were so many smart minorities. And when she got to high school, in the higher level classes there were only two or three. And so she couldn't figure out what happened. And so we asked her, you know, where did those students go? Maybe they went to a different high school. And she says, no, they're in my high school. I don't know if they're not taking the harder classes or because it's so many classes to offer, they just kind of split up and the number gets smaller. I don't know, but every class, I guarantee you, there's only in my pre-calculus class, there were two black people. My honors history class, there were two. So again, over and over, we're hearing this at these schools. And the interesting thing about this is that you might think, well, maybe that is the case. Maybe there are more classes and the students are split up. But you would expect that there might be more standard courses than there would be AP courses. So that you might find more of the students in the upper level classes because there are fewer of those classes than the standard classes. And that's, in fact, not what we saw, right? So that the standard classes um, had an overrepresentation of minority students. So it's not necessarily that black students are such a small number that they're split up across these classes. That wouldn't explain why they're overrepresented in the lower level classes. Um, and again, here's Shelley. Um, now, Shelley was explaining to us how she understood this pattern of separation and the animosity that it caused. And one of the things to point out about here is that she's not talking about race. And this is what we focused on in an earlier study, showing that this animosity towards the higher achieving students is not something that is unique to blacks. Right? All American teens experience this. And so she says, when I was in elementary school, I don't know, those years were so great because maybe you're so young. I don't know if it had to do with being separated from people, but I remember being in classes with people that were at all different levels, and it was like, it didn't matter because you're all, you know what I'm saying? You get to interact with all different people. And then in middle school, they separate you out, and then they tell you, like, you know, um, who's in the slow class and who's in the honors class. And then they expect the kids that are in the lower level classes not to have some kind of animosity towards you. I would call it animosity. That's the term for it. Kind of distaste for you, you know? It's like they give you a target on your chest and then they give people arrows to shoot at you. And so for black students, this whole uh, uh, um, process is really um, compounded by race and the segregation of students across uh, class levels. But what we find, though, is that in majority black schools, these students have no perception of this linking of race with achievement. And when we talk to them um, about uh, their experiences, as this student says, I think the number one person in our class is black. And like I told you, a lot of our honors classes are mostly black, or the classes that I've been in were mostly black anyway. And so the narratives of the students as they explain their experiences very much matched what we observed in those classrooms, right? The predominantly black schools, the majority of the classrooms are black. So for these students, the idea that you're linking achievement with race is foreign to them. In, the, um, uh, in, in this school, Flamingo, uh, uh, this student, Kwame, says, I would say there's more, well, at, like it's different. There's more, I would say, the racial breakdowns is not, in the honors class is not what you would think it would be. Or you'd think there would be more whites versus minorities and stuff like that. And it's not typical, because I think in our class, our English class is more minorities than there are whites. Uh, and so that's how it's always been, you know? Like the top, I'd say the top 10 or even 15 is majority black. That's a very different environment uh, than the students in the predominantly white and uh, racially diverse schools are experiencing and how they're coming to understand what it means to be a high achiever. And it's not connected to race here. And when we ask uh, students directly about um, acting white and whether students in their school ever connect that to doing well, um, they say, no, I haven't seen that. When they say you're acting white, it's just uh, talk a different way, like talk proper. 
right? So again, it's not that the notion of acting white in and of itself is foreign to them, but it's not connected to academic achievement. And so what I'm trying to point out in the book is the whole notion and the argument that's framed about a cultural orientation as though kids come to school with this and learn it from their communities, in fact, doesn't hold up when we go inside of schools and we look, and at least we had the opportunity to look at 19 different schools and see how, not just the racial composition of the school, but the tracking within that really begins to tell a story of how those institutional structures create that perception that whiteness and achievement are linked, right? That the high achieving students, the smart students, are uh, the white uh, students. And so I said I would get back to this question about thinking about how students are placed. And this is data I took from a study of Roz Mickelson, where she was looking at placement in Charlotte Mecklenburg. And what she was doing was just, she took students at the 90 to the 99th percentile in the um, California Achievement Test to look at where are black students who place in that high um, category <laughs> place versus white students. And you see the difference. So 81% uh, of the white students who scored in that top category on the CAT ended up in the upper level uh, uh, English track compared to just 19% of the black students who scored at that high level. And so my point in showing this is just to, uh, to address the idea that most of us think now high school tracking is less rigid and students are able to freely choose the classes that they want, but in fact, in most cases, they're not. Most schools have very elaborate um, policies about uh, requirements for students getting into advanced courses and most of the schools that we study it also involves teacher recommendations like you have to have a teacher sign off on your getting into the classes um, so again while Mickelson is looking at this quantitatively and just looking at uh, where students are placed I'm really interested in understanding what that experience means for black students in uh, those kinds of schools and so I sort of want to switch gears now as I wrap up to think about tracking and the achievement gap. And I am more convinced now that we need to shift the focus from the achievement gap to thinking about opportunity and access. As we focus on the achievement gap, we've been looking for, um, we've been looking more, I think, at the students themselves and thinking about how do we change their attitudes and behaviors? I think by talking about opportunity and access, we switch to thinking about what are the factors that um, prevent students from uh, learning? What are the factors that uh, increase students' opportunities to learn? We also start thinking more about issues of power and privilege. And we've seen a little bit of that work more and more with um, Pam Walters, for example, has been doing some of that work, thinking about opportunity hoarding. Um, Ellen Bratlinger has been also looking at um, some of those issues around power and privilege. And I think if we shift the focus to looking at those issues, we get more at understanding how institutional practices and policies limit students' opportunities to learn. One of the things we do know is that when students have access to a rigorous curriculum, test scores are higher. And so it's interesting to me that for years as we've studied the achievement gap, we have not looked at track placement. So that's not been a variable in our models of the achievement gap. It's been more things like uh, parent education, uh, student attitude, student behavior, student effort, things like that, but not track placement. How can we expect students to end up in the same place when they don't start off in the same place, right? So they don't have access to the same um, challenging curriculum. Why would we necessarily expect that they should both do well on a uh, test of their knowledge at the end? And one of the things that we also know about um, tracking is that students who are in lower level classes learn less 
than students in upper level classes. We also know that students in lower level classes have um, lower quality teachers than uh, less experienced teachers than students in the upper level classes. Um, and we also know that they have, as I said, a less challenging curriculum and more disruptive classrooms. Now, so I know a lot of people will say, oh, but um, it will never work to, to uh, group students together. But we do have uh, examples of schools that have been successful at either detracking or uh, charter schools such as the Price School in uh, San Diego that serves low income minority students predominantly and one of the criteria for entrance uh, at the school is that these students have to be first generation um, college uh, going students and that school has consistently ranked among the top uh, high schools in the nation in US News and World Report and one of the factors that that they're ranked on is access to AP courses and at that school a hundred percent of the students take AP courses right and these are low-income minority students who are tend to be talked about as at risk and these are students who generally uh, people would say they don't take AP courses, they're not capable of doing the work. And I should also say that they're not selected for that school based on achievement, right? So that's not a criteria. So it's not sort of they're self-selecting in and the best students are going to that school. Uh, and so when I, I, you know, in doing this work, although I was uh, more thinking about uh, issues of understanding student achievement, it ended up really being a book about tracking in the end and it's got me more focused on studying tracking and actually right now I'm involved in as an expert consultant in a discrimination lawsuit where a school district that's less than 10 percent black has 40 percent of the black students in, in uh, special ed and this has gone on for generations so the parents were in special ed and one of the things I'm interested in is looking at whether this school was under desegregation orders. And because what we find in the literature is that schools that were under desegregation orders were more likely to use gifted programs, magnet programs, um, and special ed, and tracking as a way to keep black and white students segregated. So much of what we're seeing in this study, and I believe in, in this particular school district, is a legacy of, of that. Um, and so I'll stop there and open up for questions. Thank you. Hi. Thank you so much. That was very uh, informative and, and engaging. Um, and I've been, I was thinking as you were talking about the, the study in Charlotte and Edmondsburg, which mm -hmm. I've been looking at the same area in terms of the Swan and post Swan right. um, uh, patterns there. And so I'm just wondering if you have any comments about the introduction of school choice as a mechanism that um, compounds some of the same findings that you are looking at. Because what I saw at Charles, Charles Mecklenburg is that um, the number of schools that had significant minority majority Right, and now it's more Hispanics than Blacks, but right. if you look generally at linguistic and ethnic minority students, um, the number of schools has uh, increased, increased tremendously, mm -hmm. and the offerings, AP and mm -hmm. other opportunity offerings in this area, has uh, accordingly decreased right. in these uh, majority minority schools. Mm -hmm. So, I'm, so, but this, I was just looking at this one uh, geographic area, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if you have a general view about the effects of the introduction of school choice on the topic, that, on opportunities and access. Mm -hmm. um, so it's an interesting story, right? Because if you look at this, you might think, well, so then maybe, you know, having segregated schools is, you know, is the way to go because kids have more access there. But in fact, we've actually, um, so some of the uh, claims I make here, we were actually testing using um, nationally represented uh, sample of uh, adolescents in, in the ad health data. And so what we find is, you know, this idea that um, in uh, majority black schools that black students have um, are more likely to take uh, uh, advanced classes we find isn't actually so. 
But where they do have an advantage is that in terms of GPA, because we actually what we were doing was sort of testing the claims against the Friar and Torelli piece about friendship. And we find that in schools that are 50% or more black, having high GPA, more friends. Um, being in advanced classes, more friends. But in schools that are below 50% black, black students uh, in advanced classes have fewer friends than black students who are not in advanced classes. So um, on the one hand, there are some benefits for black students, but they tend to be, the schools tend to be lower performing overall schools, right? So, you know, for that black student, they get a better education in the uh, more diverse school or predominantly white school, but the social environment for learning and for achievement is different in the, um, in the uh, predominantly black school. So, I mean, I think it's a difficult choice for parents to make. Uh, the issue of school choice in general, I think most of the research has shown that when, uh, for example, and, and Charlotte Mecklenburg is the, one of the best cases of this. Um, so when they um, you know, dropped the, the um, busing orders and declared the school district unitary and went to uh, choice, the schools did begin to resegregate, and we're seeing this all across the country. Um, uh, Gary Orfield has been doing a lot of work around resegregation, and we're just seeing this happening all over. And you know, one of the interesting things, too, is um, to think about, like in Wake County, for example, which is a large school district that doesn't have the kind of setup that, uh, say, a Chicago or a Detroit has with the smaller school districts and the inner city um, uh, urban districts that tend to be all black and minority, and then the outer rings with the smaller white suburban school districts. Well, in Wake County, because they combine their city and county school district into one, they then had an opportunity such that there couldn't be a lot of sort of whites leaving the inner ring and going to those schools. And so they were somewhat successful in using uh, socioeconomic status to create some diversity in their schools. And so I think we're, we might see the same patterns as they go to some other sort of school choice program or neighborhood schools. And it's interesting to me that there's so much data like Charlotte Mecklenburg. I mean, we have um, Charlotte Mecklenburg, we have this evidence that school choice programs and uh, and um, neighborhood schools does not lead to school diversity. In fact, it, it, it leads to resegregation. And it's unclear how districts think they can uh, use neighborhood schools and get diversity when our neighborhoods are so segregated. So I don't see how you get around that without some sort of um, assignment plan. Um, one person case of the Obama generation in the Charlotte Mecklenburg school system. So I want to say a couple of comments and then ask you a question. Um, so I'm a bit of an old kid for the other students. I'm old enough to have gone to first and second grade at the Lincoln Heights High School, Lincoln Heights Elementary School in my neighborhood in Charlotte. This is the heart of Charlotte, Black Charlotte in particular, West Charlotte is where I grew up. It was in, when the decision came down for Swan versus Mecklenburg, I was going into the Great, you know, old guy. Right? So, so out my generation, if you will, a month away, long ago, sort of the same year and all that, is living witness of that. So my own personal story of what happened was what at that time were 10 high schools in Charlotte. So you're coming about the explosion of high schools. When I graduated from high school in 1979, Gary did one of the buses. What happened with integration was that from these areas, Essentially, a couple of black areas in Charlotte that populated almost all of these schools. And so, living in one of those, we've been in a situation where there's things right. So, one side of the street went to Garrett, across the street went to uh, West Mecklenburg and different schools. This is literally, this is literally the biography. Okay, so um, it's interesting to me because my parents, as lifelong educators, sort of witnessed the segregation, integration, and the resegregation that is happening now. So I'm going to finish this one and then answer the question because I'm just curious. I'm not going to make this my speech at all. I just want to give you a sense of what 
is happening sort of in a, from a neighborhood perspective. So many of the schools that, in terms of people looking at this, there are even schools that are closing in the area for presumably lack of students and some other things. But there's a macroeconomic issue going on in terms of replacing and repopulating certain areas because they're now close to downtown. So there's a whole re-gentrification strategy going on. Schools closing, which will likely reopen when the population pool is different. I mean, it, this thing is really um, heavy around what persons and communities will do to have access to opportunities that they think will privilege their kids. I'll stop on that note and ask you the question, which is really more along the lines that you're talking about social impact and what happens culturally in, say, all black schools or community schools that are really supported by black neighborhoods, where you've got that nexus of the, in the traditional black culture of church, community, and school being linked up together. So my first grade teacher in all black Lincoln Heights elementary school was also a member of my church. The principal of that school was also my godfather. That was not at all uncommon. So the, the type of cultural support that enhanced achievement was part of the ethos. I wouldn't want to go back to segregation at all personally, but I'm saying that there was a nexus of community that what integration did broke all of that up so that my father and other persons would then shift out to different schools. My mother, who was one of the uh, best musician, music teachers, which they found out and knew, she then was sent to Quail Hollow Junior High School which was in the southeast part of Charlotte, the wealthiest part, because she was frankly, she, I mean, I say this with personal pride, but the reality is she was one of the top two core teachers in all of Charlotte Mecklenburg School. So rather than keep her within with Susanburg, she was then sent to Quill Hollow, where she finished out the last 15 plus years of her career. So there is this sense of opportunity structuring for success for that is behind some of this data. Enough on that, my question. It's really around, um, did you study and see in these areas what the role of the community was in any level of measurements that impacted the achievement of these students? And was there any differential response that you found, whether the students were in one type of school or another, one type of community or another, or one type of um, No, we really just focused on the students within the schools and, 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 and not so much on the community at all. But I will say that in an earlier study um, that focused on um, two all-black elementary schools, one of the elementary schools mm -hmm. was a, um, a, a black independent school. So it was a school that was created for and run by blacks uh, for black students. And it was an outgrowth of a church. And so there was that connection, right? So that the, um, all of the teachers were members of the church and the, most of the kids were um, members of the church and so everyone knew everyone. And there were some ways where it certainly did uh, provide some sort of support and benefit for students, but educationally it was not a benefit for students. Um, because what it meant was there were teachers, and, and you know, this was an elementary school, so I followed uh, third and fourth grade classrooms for a year. And there are fourth grade students who are saying, this person shouldn't be a teacher. Why is he here, right? But he's a member of the church, and so, you know, so he's in the classroom, and you know, I'm there, and I'm thinking, wow, why is he a teacher? And the, if the kids can identify that he shouldn't be a teacher, you know, so that sense that there's a community can go a little bit too far to thinking that all we need is people who love the kids and honor their culture and so forth, and then doesn't have the kinds of uh, skills that they need to be a teacher, in the end really fails the kids. And, and even the kids wanted something different. Right, from, from that experience. So although we didn't study that here, I, I did get an opportunity to sort of look at those kinds of issues in an earlier study. Hi. So what characterized students who uh, had student balance, who had, you know, who either, even if they were in a balanced white setting, that they didn't try to be part of the American community. They did have friends who were in the community. 
Right. Uh, so let me characterize their experience. Uh, as, as you were presenting, I was saying, sports play a role, right. Right. associate kind of status play a role, yeah. what, what factors for students who, because I think you said that only 13 right. students had right. quote unquote negative experience. Mm -hmm. So I actually do study um, that in the book, and so there are a couple of things. One is, you know, I'm a sociologist, so we don't necessarily study personality, but there is some of that in there. The just students are just very different personalities. So one person has something and they just shrug it off, and the other person, they're devastated by that, right? Um, but so one of the things that I note is that there are some students who other students perceive to be obnoxious and really jerks. And so there's a student that I, I, I usually uh, will highlight, but I, my focus was a little bit different, so I didn't talk about him today, who was one of those uh, students who felt that other black students were giving him a, um, a negative uh, perception, like they were bringing him down. And so he was very open about the fact that he was not like the other black students. So he would say things like, uh, I don't wake up with a basketball in my hand. I don't, um, I don't sag my pants. I don't have 18 cousins who go to the school. He would say things like this, and the other students were well aware of it. And so one of the other students at his school who was participating um, in the study used him as an example to say that it's not that black students don't value achievement and their peers who are high achieving, and in fact, they support them. But it's students like this student, she said, I think if he were laying on the floor bleeding, they would step over him and not help him. And she described how they felt, the other black students felt, as he put, him, put them down. And I think that's the same thing we saw in Sandra's experience and in some of the other experiences. To the degree that the other <coughs> black students do not feel like the high achieving students and those in the, and these AP courses are putting them down or thinking that they're better than or being arrogant, they don't have any problem with them, and in fact, they support them. So, for example, students talked about uh, if they'd be in the hallway hanging out with the black students and the bell rang, the other students would say, you need to go to class, right? So they would protect them, say, you need to protect your GPA, so forth. Um, so that was one part of it. It was sort of how that student came off to the other student. The other thing was, that to the degree that students had other outlets that put them in contact with other black students, they also had no problems whatsoever. So if they did participate in, for many of them it was athletics, so many of the boys were uh, playing on the football team or on the basketball team, um, but for some of them it was just other kinds of things. There was one school that had a, I'm gonna forget the name of it, but they had a uh, success program for black students. And so this was a way that they thought they could have black students come together uh, and also encourage other students to take advanced classes. So there were ways in which they created a space for those black students to connect to others. And some of them just made it uh, a point to not lose connections to students who they'd been friends with in elementary, middle, or um, uh, who they know from the neighborhood. One of uh, the profiles I do in the book of a student who was able to do that balancing that you're talking about um, is a student named Gwen who, in fact, um, she thought that students didn't like her and, and uh, you know, said that they would tease her and call her a nerd and say, you know, she's always in the books. But she, in fact, at a school that was, I think, only, it was less than 20% black, and she won homecoming queen. And uh, all of the students, anybody I talked to her, teachers had nothing but great things to say to her. In the classrooms, the other students talked to her. In the hallway, black students talked to her. But one of the things that I, I noticed was that she, like some other students, were lower income black students. So she lived right on the edge of a housing project. And so she knew all of those students in that area. And so the working class and, and lower income students seemed to have a much less difficult time than the middle class students who always seem to be tripped up by what it means to be black. Whereas the lower income students sort of felt like I'm poor, I know what it means to be black. And they would never 
pressed by trying to figure out what that means in the way that the middle class kids did. So it did look like class mattered to some degree to the extent that the middle class blacks had um, less contact and that they lived in uh, suburban areas. And they also seemed to have an image of blackness that was about being poor. Right, so when it, it, there wasn't a sense that you're middle class, of course you know what it means to be black, or that middle class blacks have their own, or any sense of culture and connection to blacks as a whole, there was always this sense of it's very different, it's what it means to be poor is what it means to be black. And it seemed like all the kids were operating under that sort of assumption. But yeah, if there were extracurricular activities that helped kids be more um, integrated into the black uh, community at their school, but it was also for the lower income students this sense that, you know, I know what it means to be black and I don't have to stress or go out looking for that thing. And I see that the middle class kids had more trouble with that. Yeah? yeah. Did you deal with or do you know studies that dealt with the situation of students where there is no, say, base minority population for them to play off of? Like we you talked about here where there's be at 20% mm -hmm. in the school, but then their classes that highly the balance isn't there anymore, but there's still that base population for that student to compare themselves to or to identify with. Mm -hmm. Do you have any experience with the experience of a kid that's say a population where they're a minority point where there is no base population to play against? No, I, I didn't see any schools like that in North Carolina. I think the, like I said, one of the lowest ones was the 8%. Um, but there's still a sense, even among those students in schools that have such a small population of black students, there's, all, there's still the sense that, you know, we are a community. There is that sense. But there's always the exception, like the student Curtis I just mentioned, who didn't want to be a part of a community. In, in some ways, they acknowledged that um, they were linked together. So for example, he talked about, that same student talked about um, how frustrated he was when he looked at the list of uh, the, the students in terms of the, um, I'm forgetting the name of the thing for the students who are going to be the, their juniors and then they do something at the graduation. Does anybody remember? No, it's the junior students who, the, the Right, the junior marshal. So when he looked at the list and there were no black males and he was the only black male and how discouraged he was about that. So there's a, there is a sense that you know, they're, they're linked in some ways, but there's also this distancing because there's a sense that what you're doing is really negative and I don't want to be viewed in that kind of way. I want to separate and distance myself from that. So there are always those students, but for the other students, particularly at those schools where there's a small population of students, they do tend to want to get to know one another and to, to hang out with one another. But I, I didn't have any schools that were where it was so um, tiny that the students had no connection to or sense of, you know, a community of, of black students. Hi. Um, thank you for the presentation. The sort of story arc um, is, is engaging and, and really nice inclusion by bias for the opportunity access and sort of the question right mm -hmm. I'm actually um, very much interested in those institutional and organizational structures. So now I'm focusing on tracking, right? Because actually, when I was finishing up this project, I was thinking more about looking at culture and opportunity. And then when the story became so much about tracking, I just shifted gears. And so now, um, so for example, I mentioned this um, school district that's uh, being sued by black parents for discrimination. I want to study the school district. I want to find out the history of the school in terms of the district in terms of um, when they desegregated, were they under a desegregation order, and sort of how this pattern that we see today has come about. I'm really interested in understanding um, that institutional decision making around placement uh, and, and connecting that to the legacy of uh, desegregation. 
Um, and I'm also really interested in the silence around racialized tracking. I'm really interested in the ways in which pretty much everyone involved, the students, the teachers, the administrators, it's normal. It just is the way things are. And, and how it's explained is that those are the choices students are making. And um, you know, no one is thinking about the policies that constrain students' choices. And so even as I focus here today just on high school, one of the things that I've, I've learned in this work, but I've always argued uh, even in my earlier work, is that we can't just look at the, the high school. This is the end of you know, the process. When we go back and look at uh, K through, uh, K through uh, like third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, there's so much to learn about how students get, up, get here. So most of these students were identified as gifted. And when I look at any, uh, any of the, the, like the, the third study where it was a diverse group of students, both high and low achieving, I could predict everyone's uh, placement based on gifted status. So we find that, and then we, we, because we have, you know, what that, that sample was um, maybe about, I can't remember, 50 something kids. So then we went and we got the state data with, you know, some 90,000 kids. And we looked at being identified as gifted in elementary and middle school, and then the consequences for um, AP course taking later on. And if you had been identified as gifted, and we held constant achievement, parent education, and all those other background factors, you're twice as likely to take an AP course in high school, even with the same achievement as a student who was not identified as gifted, right? So there clearly are ways that there are policies that structure students' choices later on. So by high school, really, the school can really hands off. They don't have to do anything. The students make those choices because all the kids who are identified as gifted talk about how much they need a challenge. And all the other kids talk about, oh, how difficult you know the AP course is. And so it is really um, given these kids a sense of themselves as smart, those who are identified as gifted, and the other kids not so much. Right, and so I'm, I'm really very much interested in continuing on this path of looking at that, but also asking these questions, as I said, about uh, privilege and power, and, um, and how that also structures the kinds of opportunities kids have access to uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the schools. And as I said, I'm interested in the silence. I'm also interested in, uh, you know, in the school districts that I was, that I was talking about, how uh, you know, the parents filed a uh, discrimination lawsuit only within the last couple of years, and yet they had been placed in special ed. And so when you think about your school district is about 8% black and 40% of the black kids are in AP classes, I'm wondering, no one saw this as, you know, an issue? And the school district basically just says, oh, they, they need it they needed uh, you know, that, that special ed. And the interesting thing about this case is it's not the typical case of an urban school district. It's a suburban, well-resourced school district, and most of the black families are middle-class families. So this is not the story of poor black families at all. Oh, I wonder where. I. Yeah, actually I did look at that. And so, for example, the, um, the, the school that was 89% black, when, you, when I looked at um, their requirements for getting into courses, they were not as stringent as those in the um, racially diverse and predominantly white schools. So for example, 
um, to take the, let's say, AP chemistry class, you would have had to take in some class before, that's a prerequisite, and in the predominantly white schools, you had to have a higher grade point average in that class to be able to get in. At the predominantly black school, you either didn't, there were either no grade requirements or the grade requirement was lower. So you could get in with a B minus, for example, or a B where the predominantly white schools, you needed a B plus. Um, to get into those classes. And so th those were the kind of differences you saw in terms of who gets in where. And you know, even in the gifted program, we saw differences there. So um, not in this study, but in another study, the, the third study. Uh, so in some schools, it would have to be you scored at the 99th percentile to get into the gifted program. And in other schools, it would be you have to score at the 90th percentile. But part of the reason for that is that we would find, for example, at the um, sort of the higher minority schools, the bar would be lower because there were fewer students who met that higher bar. And at the, um, the uh, uh, more white schools, there were more students who met the bar, so it was raised so that it would become a very um, sort of small um, program. So there certainly are differences in those requirements. <coughs> there are also differences in terms of how teachers and administrators think about these things. So one of the schools that we studied for um, the study number three that we did for uh, the Department of Public Instruction in North Carolina, there was a school who, that was actually making an effort to encourage more um, black students to take advanced classes. And so uh, I, they talked about uh, there was a black counselor and a white counselor, and the white counselor said she would encourage a student. If they still said no, then she would get the black counselor to talk to that student. And they increased their numbers of uh, black students in AP and honors courses. And the thing is that what people think is, oh, well, then it watered down the program. Well, these were actually kids who were capable of doing that, uh, but for some reason weren't taking the classes. And part of what we would find from the students is that students were uh, intimidated by the spaces that were all white. And they talked about having experiences of walking into a classroom and having a teacher say, this is an honors class. Are you sure you're in the right class? and those sorts of things. And so in some ways, the students made decisions about what classes they would take in terms of where they thought they would feel com comfortable. And that was not unusual for any students, for even the, um, the non-white students, that we, the non-black students that we studied, they made those uh, decisions too based on where their friends were. They wanted to feel comfortable in classes. And so we saw that as another barrier for black students to the extent that friends were less likely to be in the upper level classes. Thank you. Thank you.